Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Constitution Center, Federalist Society, and American Constitution Society's debate about the First Amendment and single gender organizations. I am Jeffrey Rosen, the president of the National Constitution Center, which is a wonderful institution in Philadelphia with an inspiring mandate from Congress to disseminate information about the U.S. Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. And our mission is to bring together all sides, liberals and conservatives and everyone in between, to debate not political issues, but constitutional issues. And we have a wonderful partnership with the Federalist Society and the American Constitution Society, where we're traveling around the country hosting debates on constitutional topics. We've been to San Francisco and New York and Chicago, and uh, we're going to uh, uh, Seattle, and basically we bring together top debaters to discuss constitutional issues. We also have, and I'm going to give a plug for this thrilling new app, an amazing interactive constitution, which I want you to download. Not now, because I'm talking, you have to listen to the debate. But after the show, and you will find in the App Store this amazing constitution, co-sponsored by FedSoc and ACS. You can click on any part of the constitution, pick a nice uncontroversial part like the Second Amendment, and you'll find the top liberal and conservative scholars nominated by the Federalist Society and the American Constitution Society with a thousand words about what they agree the provision means, and then separate statements about what they disagree the provision means. And multiply that by the 80 clauses of the Constitution, and you have a constitutional feast, a thrilling nonpartisan source that allows people to explore areas of agreement and disagreement. We want to bring it to every student in America from AK. Let us uh, jump right into this uh, wonderful debate. Uh, and the format is as follows. Before the opening arguments, I, uh, we have to keep us thrilling the polls. Oh, the polls is good. The whole fun of this debate is the polls, because you are going to debate, uh, you're going to vote on the motion before and after the debate. And the side that wins is the side that changes the most minds. So I want you to approach this question with an open mind. I can tell you, having read the prep of our crack constitutional prep team at the Constitution Center, this is an open constitutional question. There are good arguments on both sides. So I want you to listen hard to the debaters and be prepared to change your mind after hearing the arguments. I want you to do one other thing. This is not a policy debate, it is a constitutional debate. In other words, you might think that Harvard's policy on single gender organizations is a bad idea, but it is consistent with the First Amendment. Or you might think that Harvard's policy is a good idea, but it is forbidden by the First Amendment. And that important distinction that lawyers are taught to make all the time is one that we want to enter into in the spirit of this constitutional debate. And that's why our debaters are going to be focusing on the First Amendment question. Uh, there is a technical uh, question. Harvard is a private university. It is not formally bound by the First Amendment. I learned from uh, Professor Kennedy that in the Derek Bach administration, Harvard chose to bind itself to the First Amendment. Our debaters can choose how they want to address this question. But we have phrased the motion uh, by saying, resolve penalties for students who join single gender organizations violate core First Amendment values. So in other words, you can set aside the question of whether Harvard is formally violating the First Amendment and address the question of whether First Amendment values which find public and private institutions are being violated. All right, uh, each side is going to have five minutes to make an opening argument, followed by a five-minute rebuttal. We'll then have a Q&A that I will uh, moderate. I'll ask a few questions, and then you'll have the chance to ask some questions on note cards, and we'll conclude with a three-minute three minute closing statement from each side, and then you'll vote again on the motion. Uh, it's now my honor to welcome our debaters arguing for the motion, Sanford Levinson, visiting professor of law, and the W. St. John Garwood and W. St. John Garwood, Jr., Centennial Chair in Law at the uh, University of Texas uh, Law School. Uh, Harry Lewis is Gordon McKay Professor of Computer Science and former Dean of Harvard College. Arguing against the motion, David Howell is Professor of Japanese History and editor of the Harvard Journal of Asiatic Studies. And Diane Rosenfeld is lecturer on law and the founding director of the Gender Violence Program at Harvard Law School. Um, we're going to jump right into this. Let me just briefly uh, provide a neutral and balanced uh, summary of the facts. In May 2016, after findings by the Harvard University Task Force on the Prevention of Sexual Assault, reported the involvement in the finals clubs, increased the likeliness that a Harvard College woman would experience 
non-consensual, non-consensual sexual contact, the university issued a policy that said starting with the class of 2021, undergraduate members of unrecognized single gender social organizations like final clubs will be banned from holding athletic team, captain seats, and leadership positions in recognized student groups and will not receive endorsements for fellowships and scholarships, including the Rhodes and Marshall. And our debate question today is whether that policy uh, stated broadly as penalties for students who join single or gender organizations violates core First Amendment values. We're going to begin with a five minute opening statement from uh, the pro team, and I'm going to call first on uh, Professor Lewis. Give me, thank you so much. Uh, very important to vote first. It's a, uh, it increases the dramatic tension, but before Professor Lewis uh, starts, <laughs> I want you to vote on the motion. And remember, the, uh, the motion is, and I'll read it again. Penalties for students who join single gender organizations violate core, core First Amendment values. If you agree with that motion, vote yes. If you disagree, vote no. And how do you do that? Um, if, uh, if, you're, if you agree with it, press yes. If you oppose, if you disagree with it, press no, and then hit send. Once you've hit send, your answer will be displayed back to you. That means your response has been recorded. How do you get Beyond Ready? How do you get, now you're getting way above my pay grade. Has, has anyone else gotten Beyond Ready? No one is getting Beyond Ready. That means, hey. We will give it one other second, and if this fails, we will take a show of hands. Not found. All right. Sincere apologies, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we are going to take a show of hands. This will be an impressive. Oh, you got it? Oh, excellent. Good. Refresher clickers, and all will be well. The secret ballot. Uh, prevails. Sorry about that. And are we told to vote? No or yes, and then hit send. Look up at me once you vote. <laughs> Wonderful. On the assumption it looks like most people have voted, thanks so much for your patience with that. And then if I can have your attention, please, please join me in welcoming for the motion, Professor Lewis. Thank you, Jeffrey, and thank you for inviting me. So the policy punishes students for simply joining a club, even if they've done nothing that is unlawful or contrary to any other rule of Harvard. Um, there's, uh, even though the First Amendment, as was said, does not apply here, I didn't know that about uh, President Bach having bound Harvard to the First Amendment, but even assuming that it doesn't apply, the spirit of it should in a great university like this. And the spirit of the First Amendment is that sometimes individuals get together for reasons that the governing authority does not like. In a society based on the rule of reason, the First Amendment expresses our confidence that in the long run, we're all better off letting people exercise that freedom of association like their freedoms of speech and of religion. And I think this should hold even more so in a university as it does in civil society. There are, in fact, Harvard precedents for the notion that Harvard honors the principle that people should not be punished for joining clubs. 
It's a value we've honored even though we don't have to. When Harvard was trying to figure out how to handle the Reserve Officers Training Corps, which was a discriminatory organization in violation of Harvard non-discrimination policies, Harvard considered and rejected the option of punishing students for joining. And it did that because it decided that trying to dictate students' private choices would be excessively paternalistic. That was the phrase. When we are hiring faculty, the university actually prohibits search committees from asking about club memberships. And of course, in the 1950s, Harvard protected faculty who joined the Communist Party, which was surely even more hated than the final clubs are today. <laughs> Finally, I would just say that Harvard is an educational institution, and education should be our first recourse when we're trying to change students' minds about how they behave. Learning to think heretical thoughts and to make unpopular decisions are part of growing up. Moreover, we as an institution should be modeling the behavior we want our graduates to follow when they become leaders. We should be dealing with organizations we don't like by evidence and reason, explaining and teaching rather than punishing their members. I'm not here to defend the final clubs, and I will not do that, and I'm not going to parse the statistics you quoted, but most of the students affected by the policy are not final club members. The argument put forward for punishing members of sororities is particularly scary. Quote, the policy is the right one for the long-term needs of the community. In other words, the judgment of the central government takes precedence over individual rights to private associations. That logic takes us way beyond the problems of sexual assault and alcohol that were initially used to justify the policy. Thank you so much for that opening statement, arguing uh, against the motion, Professor Howell. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Uh, I do not think that penalizing students who join single gender organizations violates the core of First Amendment values. Or to be more precise, I do not think that withholding certain privileges from Harvard College students who join unrecognized single gender social organizations violates First Amendment. I want to be precise because the Harvard College policy that prompted this debate does not impose penalties on students who join just any single gender organization. Rather, it is directed at students who join a short list of specific organizations, some final clubs, fraternities, and sororities. These unrecognized single gender social organizations, or USGSOs, as uh, Harvard likes to use uh, the clunky acronym, uh, are in fact Harvard student organizations, even though they are formally independent. Their membership is limited to Harvard College students and alumni, and they have been closely tied to Harvard throughout their history. They would not exist if it were not for their ties to Harvard College. Whatever their legal status, they must be seen as Harvard student organizations and therefore distinguished from other private groups. Indeed, Final Clubs, the oldest of which was founded in 1790, were treated as Harvard student organizations until 1984, when the college rescinded its recognition of them. It took this action in response to their refusal to admit women. According to the dean of the college, Rakesh uh, Purana, quote, the college hoped that cutting ties with these organizations would either lead them to become gender inclusive or stem their impact on the social culture and social life of the college, unquote. Although some of these clubs do admit both men and women, their influence on student culture and social life has only increased during the 33 years since the college was created. Because US GSOs are, for all practical purposes, Harvard student organizations, they should be subject to the same rules that govern those that are recognized by the college. At the core of those rules is the principle of inclusion. Every student who applies to Harvard College does so knowing that inclusion is at the heart of Harvard's mission. No one has to attend Harvard College. If one does not agree with the college's commitment to inclusion, one need not come here. Choosing to attend Harvard, therefore, requires acquiescing to abide by the core values that govern community life at the college. Among them is the principle of inclusion. No one should be excluded from the community on the basis of gender, race, sexual orientation, religion, or any other type. In any event, under the new policy, one can attend Harvard College and still be a member of a US GSO. Individual students must 
choose between membership in uh, a, a single set, unrecognized single sex uh, organization uh, and the opportunity to represent Harvard College as a sports team captain, leader of, a, of student government, or a dean's nominee for Rhodes or other prestigious outside fellowship. Insofar as these opportunities are privileges rather than rights per se, the dean should be free to withhold his endorsement of any student who does not represent Harvard's ideals, including the stated policy of inclusion. I do not see any violation of First Amendment values in the college's decision not to reward students who belong to organizations based on principles of exclusion and discrimination. Now, critics of the policy have said that it violates students' freedom of association. On the surface, this is a compelling argument. Indeed, I agree that students should be free to join any true off-campus group they please, be it the Daughters of the American Revolution, the Green Party, or even the American Contract Bridge League, without fear of being penalized by Harvard. But final clubs and other US GSOs are not genuine off-campus groups, whatever their formal legal status. Freedom of association looks very different when one sees the US GSOs as Harvard student groups. Instead of associations of like-minded hobbyists or political fellow travelers, they are re revealed as nothing more than groups that exist to exclude other members of the Harvard community on the basis of gender, wealth, social connections, and other arbitrary criteria. Their appeal to the right of freedom of association is, in fact, just a ruse to justify the exclusion and discrimination they find. Beha uh, behavior that is anathema to the community their members voluntarily joined when they chose to matriculate at Harvard College. Indeed, seeing freedom of association in both to protect exclusion and discrimination brings to mind the way segregationists in Atlanta in the early 1960s appealed to a right to freedom of association to rationalize excluding African-American children from all white schools. As the historian Kevin Cruz puts it, quote, they did not define freedom of association positively in terms of what outside groups they could join, but negatively in terms of which groups of outsiders they could shun, unquote. Harvard College has no responsibility to protect the freedom of some students to exclude other students from the college community. A policy intended to curb such exclusionary groups does no harm to First Amendment values. Thank you so much, Professor Howell. Uh, arguing in favor of the motion, Professor Levinson. Thank you. Let me begin very quickly with an anecdote. Uh, is your mic on? Can you hear me now? Uh, an anecdote taken from Linda Greenhouse's wonderful book on Justice Blackman. Um, I don't know whether it's his first opinion for the court or not, but very early in his term, he wrote an opinion in which he said something. Oh, this is a really tough case. There's much to be said on both sides, but we're faced with the Trump decision now, and I decide in favor of the petitioner. And Hugo Black apparently stormed into his chambers and said, never write and suggest that there's any doubt. Always assume that uh, truth, justice, and the American way and the Constitution are on your side, and the views of the other side are in a phrase that is overused by majorities of the Supreme Court without merit. Um, I'm actually with Justice Black on this. I think this is a close case. I think there are people of goodwill on both sides. Uh, but I have no problem, uh, either as a lawyer or, for that matter, as an alum of Harvard Graduate School, arguing, uh, I guess, in favor of the motion. Um, I begin with the point that to talk about the First Amendment is somewhat misleading, and it's not for the reason the First Amendment doesn't apply to Harvard, even though Harvard ostensibly has said, oh yes, we voluntarily accept the First Amendment. Let me tell you, the First Amendment Harvard, the First Amendment University of Texas, where I teach, would be altogether different. The University of Texas does not have a memorial church with a chaplain who is paid by the University of Texas. And I take it would be flatly unconstitutional. I hope it would be regarded as flatly unconstitutional if the University of Texas decided to build the memorial church. Uh, uh, so that's one problem. The First Amendment, after all, this becomes relevant to the overall argument, uh, includes a whole bunch of things. <coughs> the text of the First Amendment talks about speech. We're not talking about speech. We're talking about something called the Freedom of Association, which I think is an important right <laughs> and liberty that has become attached to the First Amendment 
largely ironically, Professor Har Holly mentions uh, Southern segregationists in Atlanta, probably the most important of the two association cases involves the NAACP in Alabama, uh, uh, and also in Little Rock, Arkansas, uh, where the authorities wanted names. Who belongs to the NAACP? Uh, and the Supreme Court, and actually divided decisions. This was not regarded as a slam dunk. Uh, but in divided and correct decisions said that there is a protected right to freedom of association that, is, that goes beyond simply a formal freedom to write a letter to the editor or sign a petition or something like that. Um, and these are very important decisions. And that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about judicially created doctrine, largely in the 1950s and 60s, to protect vulnerable groups. Now, obviously, I presume most of us don't view the Porcelain Club or the Fly Club as a vulnerable group, but how important should that be in terms of a legal analysis, which is the rules we're playing under, if we recognize that there is something within the judicially defined First Amendment called the Freedom of Association, and that the state ought not be able to limit freedom of association, the state or university ought not be able to limit freedom of association, unless it has a very, very good reason to do so. The legal jargon is a compelling interest uh, to do so, and then the remedy, how you achieve this interest, has to be narrowly tailored to the end you're trying to achieve. Let me say, when I read Harvard's policy and the justification for the policy, I find a complete hash. Uh, I do not understand, for example, why it applies to sororities. Because I think it's fair to say that everybody knows this is about male violence against women uh, or male misogyny against women. There may be instances running the other way, but quite frankly, that is not thought to be a viable problem. Uh, but what the university has done is to offer something tremendously overbroad in terms of achieving their goal without, I think, any explanation. And then we could get to additional points that perhaps will come up in the Q&A about even if you want to say, OK, we really do need to move against misogyny, whether it makes sense to focus on final clubs rather than, say, the Roman Catholic Church or Orthodox Judaism or uh, other examples of misogynistic institutions that, quite frankly, are far more important uh, in our culture uh, than uh, the final. Thank you so much. And arguing against the motion, Professor Rosen. Thank you. And thank you for arranging this debate. This is what Harvard is all about. And I love the opportunity. I appreciate the opportunity to, to participate. So I have many more thoughts on this issue that I hope to deliver in, in five minutes. Um, I, my area of teaching and concern is about gender violence and about our constitutional rights to challenge male sexual violence. So this is kind of firmly in my in my camp. The first thing to note is that the Constitution does not apply directly to public policies. The Constitution Constitution does not apply directly to college campuses. It applies to state-funded universities and to, and to lesser extent, much lesser extent, to private institutions. But that's not to say that we don't want to import important constitutional values into our campuses, into our private university campuses here at Harvard, for example. But it's not an absolutist First Amendment application that we should let frame the and even within a First Amendment analysis, sexual harassment, for example, is can be speech, but it's not tolerated in schools. And then another layer of analysis here is about 
about the application of Title IX to college campuses. So we have the guarantee under Title IX, which was an amendment to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, guaranteeing equal access to educational opportunities. And I think that as a legal realist, I consider I consider that to be quite important in the context of the debate about the First Amendment. So I want to think about that as the frame. What does equal access to educational opportunities mean? And when I look at historically the efforts at Harvard to address and prevent campus sexual assault, <coughs> the relationship, the very critical relationship between that and monitors. So I agree with Harry that, that or, or actually with Sandy, about regulating sororities under the wide brush stroke of this of this motion is problematic because the real reason for this motion was because of concern about sexual assault being committed disproportionately at my college and, and fraternities. So why sweep sororities in into that? And I think that that Harvard was trying to look like it was being fair about it, but I think it might have it might have found a finer brush that could to paint this picture. But if you're trying to get at sexual assault at final clubs and get to the hostile environments that are often perpetuated within an exclusive all-male envir environment and trying to regulate that, I believe that that is a fair regulation and a really important endeavor if you're looking at trying to achieve the promise of inclusion that Harvard University is based upon and equal access to educational opportunities. So constitutionally, um, we think about separate but equal, and the BMI case comes to mind, which involved the Virginia Military Institute's exclusion of women in 1996 that was struck down by the Supreme Court. Even though in the initial phases of the case, after admitting that it was a state school, they absolutely refused to have women. Um, they said that it was all-male environment of teaching masculinity and military values to from men to men that included a lot of the kind of imposition of gender-based hierarchy that is fundamentally tied to misogynist values. And the school tried to create a separate but equal opportunity for women with the Virginia Women's Institute for Leadership. And they were unable to create an equal, a comparably equal opportunity for women because it didn't have the same faculty, it didn't have the same resources, it didn't have the same privilege and access to alumni networks. And that seems quite apt in, in an analysis of the final club regulations. So we have to, I think, be legal realists and think about what we're actually trying to regulate here and decide if it's and I think that it is. I think that um, we can talk more about this in question and answer, but um, this is a really significant problem and that sexual assault absolutely interferes with our right to equal access to educational opportunity and the Harvard value of inclusion. So I think that this motion is the first step toward creating a more inclusionary culture at Harvard, and there's no reason that we can't recreate Thank you so much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our debaters for their great opening statements. All right, we have some time for question and answer. I'm going to take out my constitutional reading glasses, and our crack uh, constitutional prep team at the NCC has discovered one case that seems closest to the facts at hand. It's called Chi Iota Colony. Uh, a New York district court found that an all-male fraternity which had been denied college recognition for limiting membership to a single gender was an intimate association as defined by the Boy Scouts case where the Supreme Court held that the Boy Scouts couldn't be forced to admit uh, gay scoutmasters because they had an expressive interest in sending a message that they weren't opposed to gays and lesbians. Uh, the district court uh, on, on appeal, the case was dismissed, and the court tried to measure the association's 
interest in intimacy and the strength in that associational interest had to be balanced against the state's interest in restricting organizational freedom. Sandy, that case uh, held that fraternities do have expressive interests and they are also small enough to be intimate associations as defined by the Supreme Court. Is that case uh, persuasive or not? And how does that apply to the Harvard policy? Um, yeah, the the Boy Scout case was a standard model five to four case. Um, much of it turns, I think, on what one means by an intimate association. There are also cases involving, I think, uh, the JCs and Rotary Clubs. Um, I presume that Harvard's argument is that one has to take account of, uh, I know almost nothing about the Harvard Final Clubs. Um, uh, I don't know that I've ever consciously met somebody who's been a member of the Porcellian, but the one thing we do know about the Porcellian Club is that it's a remarkably important institution, not only at Harvard, but in American society, it's like skull and bones. And so the argument that the court accepted for the JCs is that you have to take into account what you know, they might call the penumbras and emanations of ostensibly private clubs with society at large. Um, but of course, there are answers to that in the Boy Scout case itself. These, this is why these are close cases. And you know, I indicated why I come down on the side I'm defending. Uh, which is to say that Harvard's policy is unwise. But I do think the strongest argument really has to do with a closely textured argument about the social and political reality of final clubs as opposed to some group nobody has ever heard of and really represents um, you know, people who want to get together for misguided reasons but there are no externalities, shall we say, on the wider society. So a lot of this is empirical. Um, uh, but I mean, one of the paradoxes, I gather from reading the New York Times that Porcellian doesn't allow women into their sacred territory. If that's the case, then I literally don't understand how a policy based on what may very well be justified fear of sexual harassment and worse at parties. Uh, I was in fraternity at, at Duke 50 years ago. Uh, so there's reason to be concerned about fraternity parties. But, <laughs> but, but you know, if the Porcellian Club never has parties, then how can this policy really apply to them unless what you really want to do is try to cleanse their thoughts about the wisdom of all male organizations. Thank you for that. As Professor Rosenfeld, I want to ask you about the Chi Iota case, which went on to say that there's no law deeming single sex organizations per se unconstitutional. On the contrary, in support of their preservations, fraternities, sororities, and other single sex organizations have been specifically excluded from federal gen uh, gender anti discrimination legislation. Is it true that the Harvard clubs and frats are excluded from federal anti gender? Uh, discrimination and was the Coyota case correct to find that fraternities do have an associational First Amendment interest? They, uh, they are excluded on their Harvard has enacted a right to 
Uh, Professor Lewis, uh, your opponents have said that uh, anyone who comes to Harvard should accept Harvard's policy of inclusion. Does Harvard itself have a First Amendment or associational right to define itself as the kind of university that spurns discrimination? And is that right protected by First Amendment values? Could you repeat the question? Sure. Does Harvard have First Amendment interest in defining itself as a university that repudiates uh, sexism in student organizations. Sure. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, you saw I'm going to tell, I, I'm going to tell a, a, a story here. Um, so first of all, I would, I would note I, a lot of what Diane said I 100% agree with. And if we were debo debating the motion that she would prefer be, we be debating, I might think differently. But the motion refers not to the final clubs. The, the motion refers to the single gender organizations, uh, uh, the single gender organizations in general. And I'm going to, at some peril here, because I, the person implicated may be in the audience for all I know, but I, I was talking to a, a, a student of mine about what she thought of the policy. And she said, well, actually, I'm in a sorority, so you can guess what I think. And I, and I, you know, I laughed about it, and she and I said, but what, you know, don't you believe in inclusion? And uh, she said, give me a break. I'm a math major. There's not a single senior woman in the math department. I sit all day surrounded by men who act like I don't belong there. And I, and I need a lecture from Harvard about being opposed to gender inclusivity because I want to hang out at my sorority at night off campus. So, you know, that was sort of, I mean, that's the motion before us is, should she be punished? Should she be like removed from being the presidency, of the president of the Democratic Club? I mean, this is the, you're apparently ineligible to be head of any student organization, including political organizations, journalistic organizations, if you belong to a sorority, which is the place to where this woman hangs out at night because she can relax as opposed to the way she feels in class all day long. Uh, Professor Howell, maybe worth responding to that point. Why should that woman be excluded from a sorority which has nothing to do with gender or violence? Right. Uh, well, a few points. One is that there are lots of recognized student organizations throughout campus uh, that are uh, formally open to anyone who might want to be a member, but are, uh, as a practical matter, uh, composed uh, overwhelmingly of uh, either women or all uh, members of ethnicity or uh, religious groups, uh, and they seem to work just fine in general. Uh, and they have to be open to everyone because Harvard uh, is the subject of Title IX, uh, and I think uh, my understanding of Title IX uh, is incomplete, but, my, but I, as I understand it, uh, Harvard does not have uh, exclusionary groups uh, under Title IX. Uh, I think a broader question, though, and and then I would add that although sororities, fraternities, and final clubs are formally outside of the university, uh, they are de facto student organizations. And I think a case might be made that Title IX should apply to them as well. Uh, but the broader question about whether, uh, say, for example, women should have a safe space uh, or members of uh, minority groups should have a space, a, a so called safe space, uh, uh, congregate. That, on the surface, uh, is quite appealing, and I can certainly uh, understand uh, and sympathize with uh, Professor Lewis's thinking. Um, uh, Drew Faust, uh, our president, wrote uh, an op-ed uh, in the in the Christian, uh, a few months ago uh, about uh, this very issue, uh, and she described the long and uh, arduous process by which Harvard College and Radcliffe College merged, uh, and she said that. The greatest opposition to the final merger of Harvard and Radcliffe actually came uh, from women uh, alumni, professor, alumni professors on the Radcliffe side, uh, where they invoked many of the same arguments uh, used by members of sororities uh, that they did not work in a safe space. Uh, she, she made the compelling argument, I think, that although it is painful, it will be painful, it's important for Harvard to become a, a single community. Uh, and that those sorts of uh, spaces uh, ought to, at least over time, be dissolved so that everyone can feel 
free to be a member of the entire community. In that sense, I think that ideally, I'm now I'm maybe not a canon professor at uh, Temple of House, but I, I think that uh, I can imagine a future of Harvard where uh, no one feels entirely safe because no one feels complete ownership of any group or community on campus. That every group is diverse, whether it's by gender, religion, sexual orientation, et cetera, et cetera, and that everybody feels a little bit out of place. Uh, that there is no place that belongs only to white men, which I think for many, many, many years, Harvard was such a place. And the only way to break that down is to repudiate the idea of separate communities within the larger communities that are segregated, uh, even self-segregated, uh, by gender or other criteria. Thanks so much. Uh, I know people have one o'clock classes, so we have time for one question for each side, and then we are going to vote. And the questions are excellent. This one is prof for Professors Lewis and Levinson. Is there a difference between the freedom to associate with those of a certain belief system, such as the Communist Party, cited by Professor Lewis, and the freedom to associate with those of certain immutable traits, such as the white-only groups cited by Professor Howell? How are the latter groups compatible with equal protection? Professor Lewis. Sounds like a legal question to me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sandy, you want to take it? Um, I mean, frankly, it would take longer than we have, and there are reasons why, for better or worse, courses in the 14th Amendment last a semester. And the distinction between so-called immutable traits, and we happen to know, and this has been one of the tremendous changes of consciousness in even the last 10 years, that sex and gender are not immutable um, in the way they had been thought to be, say, 20 or 30 years ago. Um, um, and certainly race may or may not be immutable. Um, but it, you know, it seems to me at the end of the day that that's not going to be a truly winning distinction. I mean, what about a, a group of students who define themselves by what many of us would call their disability? They would define as different sorts of abilities. They may very well be immutable. They were born with them, but they certainly constitute an important aspect of their lives. This is not very helpful, I suspect, but it's a, this is why there's a semester-long course. I'm just trying to tease out this sort of distinction. Great. Uh, one last question, then we'll have closing arguments. If Harvard has a policy of inclusivity, then how is it the university approves numerous single gender, single ethnic group, and single race organizations? Uh, uh, whoever, uh, first, Professor Howell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, <coughs> I think the key thing is that all of these groups, even the names that have, that suggest uh, a single group, which is the Asian Pacific American Women for Service, I may have given a slightly negative, uh, but anyway, uh, Founded by Asian American women, Asian Pacific American women engaged in community service, uh, does exist uh, at Harvard. But formally, it's open to all Harvard college students, whether they're women, whether they're men, whether they're Asian Pacific American or not. Uh, and that, uh, in practice, almost all of their members are Asian Pacific uh, American women. Uh, but they have had, to my understanding, they have had a few uh, male members over the years. Men who join that group uh, do so in, uh, uh, out of a desire to um, engage in service or to uh, learn more about the Asian American uh, experience, and that uh, it's worked out well. Uh, I can imagine you know, that there would be times when it wouldn't always work out well, but in fact, there are lots of such organizations that are open to everyone and they seem to work just fine. Just out of curiosity, are there all male singing? Groups and all women singing groups open to members of the opposite gender. Uh, yes, so there are uh, groups uh, that are uh, based on uh, some kind of talent, you know, whether it's uh, audition, where you one has to audition uh, to be uh, accepted into a cappella group uh, or try out to uh, get onto a sports team. Uh, in those cases, um, uh, I know that this year the um, this, uh, one of the main uh, all male 
a proposal to give call, uh, a woman who auditioned for a callback. I don't know if she made the final cut or not. She did not. Uh, but very, I mean, very few people who auditioned uh, make it. Uh, so uh, if a woman can sing a cappella in a way that conforms with the repertoire of uh, uh, then they are open to admitting women. And they have to let women uh, audition. Uh, other, like sports teams, uh, because of the way the NCAA works, uh, if there's a man's basketball team, then there's a women's basketball team. And that's the aspect of Title IX, nine of course, that, that most people know about. That. Great. Well, it's time, ladies and gentlemen, for closing arguments. They're going to be three minutes each. And the first one is to Professor Levinson. Um, Two quick points. One quick question. Uh, um, another semester long course involves the modern welfare state and particularly conditional funding. Harvard went to the US Supreme Court in a case, alas, that they lost, eight to nothing, uh, over whether or not the federal government could force uh, the Harvard Law School and all other parts of Harvard to be hospitable to the discriminatory Department of Defense rather than, in essence, force the OD to have job interviews across the common at the hotel. Um, this rests in part on whether one finds federal, federal funds to be subsidies that we don't deserve. They're gifts from the national government. And you learned from the time you were a child that whoever pays the piper can call the tomb or whether they are attempts to use power to mold behavior that an autonomous university would prefer not to engage in. Um, and I think it's interesting that Justice Kagan cast her vote in the Obamacare case um, on what many people thought was a surprising side because of the whole issue of overbearing coercion by those with power. So I think, you know, we, again, we could go on for days about whether we can tell the same should be the penalty and the subsidy. Very, very last point. Listening to this discussion uh, makes me understand more what my very, very close friend, Randy Kennedy, has always been somewhat suspicious of group claims and has defended many conversations over the years a certain kind of liberalism based on individual identity and individual difference. When I keep hearing the notion of inclusion and community, I confess that I hear a certain totalistic aspect. It does seem to me, you know, in many ways the most important thing I did in my public life was to attend Harvard as a graduate student. And I'm endlessly grateful for what I received from Harvard. That being said, I don't think I'm defined <laughs> simply as a Harvard alum. It's one part of my identity, but only one part. And I really would be quite resentful if I got a letter from the president, whom I rather admire, saying, you know, you're really part of our community as we define the community and shape up or else. Um, yeah, it's a tough question, but I, I do have certain doubts about the claims of inclusiveness as against a recognition of diversity and that people are going to have very different views on how to live their life, many of which, if you take diversity seriously, it means, as Justice Holmes pointed out, toleration for at least some thoughts that we hate. There are always boundaries. I'm not a complete tolerationist. But it is important to recognize that we have to put up with people we really don't like, who have views we don't like, and who engage in behaviors we don't like. Yeah. So some limit. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor Levinson, last word to Professor Rosenthal.
Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Please join me in thanking our debaters. The thrilling moment has arrived for our second vote, so please consult your clickers, and I'm going to pray that they work. And once again, uh, you are voting on uh, the motion. And if you are in favor of it, please press yes. And if you are opposed, please press no. And uh, after you have cast your vote, press send. And uh, the motion is resolved. Uh, penalties against students who join single gender organizations violates core First Amendment values. Now, as our crack constitutional prep team is tabulating the results, I'm going to vamp and give you some more plugs for the thrilling constitutional <laughs> program of the National Constitution Center. If you thought the interactive constitution wasn't cool enough, there's more. I'm like a Ginsu knife salesman. In addition to being able to click on any provision of the Constitution and see leading liberals and conservatives nominated by the Federalist Society and the American Constitution Society debate it, you can also compare any part of the Constitution to constitutions around the globe. So you can see the way we protect the American Fourth Amendment and the fact that Japan cut and paste our Fourth Amendment and the language is 53% the same, whereas the Russian Fourth Amendment looks nothing like ours on the Russian Fourth Amendment. Ladies and gentlemen, this is another pitch. You can become involved in this really important civic project of constitutional education and debate. We have podcasts every week where I get to call up the leading liberal and conservative scholars in America. I want you to listen to them. They're called We the People. They're getting 400,000 downloads a week. And people are hungry in this country right now, in this polarized time, for this kind of civil discussion, which elevated this conversation uh, in a profound way and encouraged us to separate our constitutional and political views. We have an incredible blog, Constitution Daily. Um, the interactive constitution has gotten 7 million hits since it launched. The blog uh, has made us the third most visited museum website in the country. Uh, you guys at the law school or in the college, if you want to write about constitutional issues or volunteer or intern, uh, let me know, jrosen at constitutioncenter.org. Uh, our crack webmaster is a graduate from the college from a few years ago, and he's doing a great job. 
and we are eager to bring you on board in this great civic project. And mostly what I'm doing as I'm vamping and waiting for the results <laughs> is encouraging you to keep an open mind and to educate yourselves about constitutional issues. This country is full at the moment and moving ahead uh, about constitutional debates that are going to be full of the headlines every day. Just uh, two days ago, the question was whether the president-elect had violated the Foreign Emoluments Clause when he accepted uh, uh, an invitation to hose, uh, house a foreign ambassador at one of his hotels. Uh, many of us hadn't heard of the Foreign Emoluments Clause before yesterday, but by clicking on the interactive constitution, Adam Liptak in the New York Times found two experts nominated by FedSoc and ACS, Zephyr Teachout and Ben Tillman, and interviewed them and uh, entertained their difference of opinion. Another really exciting thing about this debate is you see that these are close questions where people can respectfully disagree. Sandy quoted Justice Holmes, we believe at the Constitution Center, the Constitution is made for people of fundamentally differing points of view. It is a system of uh, governance and structure that encourages us to develop our faculties of reason, as Louis Brandeis said, so that we can make up our own minds and fully participate as citizens. And that's why this part, do you know how beautiful it is that FedSoc and ACS nominated these debaters, have come here respectfully, and are bringing you uh, here? It is, it's inspiring, and we learn through this project that people can disagree very strongly, but they can disagree civilly, and together the conversation itself can shape the meaning of the Constitution. So that's why I was so thrilled to come to Harvard to host this debate, so grateful to our debaters for participating, and so relieved that Kate is about to hand me the staff <laughs> that will give us... I was not about that. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm not either, so I'm going to study this for a sec so I don't bungle it. Even, this is even more exciting than the Oscars. Um, all right, before the motion, uh, before the debate, you voted 69% uh, in favor of the motion and 30% opposed. And the question is, penalties for students who join single gender organizations violate core First Amendment values. After the debate, you voted 82% in favor of the motion and 18% opposed. That is a 40% change. Please join me in congratulating <laughs> Professor Powell and Rosenthal. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who are still here, I uh, we had a little glitch on the uh, name, names of the winners. It's, let me just read it again. Uh, before it was 69 to, 80, to, to 30, after it was 82 to 18, therefore the winners are Harry Lewis and Sandy Levinson. Thanks. Thank you very much.